Arbitration Act scholar. Professor Salai is the Judge John D. Wessel Distinguished Professor of Social Justice at Loyola University in New Orleans College of Law. His work has been published in leading journals and cited in briefs filed in the United States Supreme Court and other federal and state, Supreme, or, and state courts um, in, in cases involving the Federal Arbitration Act. Professor Salai wrote a leading book about the enactment and development of modern arbitration laws called Outsourcing Justice, The Rise of Modern Arbitration Laws in America. This book examines the history of modern arbitration laws and the original intent behind these laws and demonstrates how the US Supreme Court has grossly misconstrued them. Professor Saleh E. has also presented written testimony to Congress regarding arbitration law. In connection with litigation, he's written several amicus briefs and served as an expert regarding arbitration issues. He has been interviewed and quoted in national media regarding arbitration. Professor Saleh E. also serves as an arbitrator in commercial cases and maintains a blog about arbitration at www.arbitrationusa.com. So for a little bit, um, I guess I'll, I'll send it off to you then, Professor Saleh E. Um, for those of you who haven't been keeping up with federal arbitration um, clause litigation lately, um, in a after the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movement, there was a rare showing of bipartisanship in Congress um, that just enacted a landmark amendment banning forced arbitration for sexual harassment and sexual assault claims. And Congress is currently debating additional amendments. This term, the Supreme Court's hearing five separate cases involving arbitration, which is an unprecedented amount. And uh, the justice has been sharply divided on the issue of arbitration. So now I will turn things over to Professor Salai to discuss the history of our modern arbitration laws, the impact of these laws on our civil justice system, why these arbitration clauses can be a divisive topic, and the next steps for working to limit the harmful impacts of forced arbitration. Thank you so much, Professor Salai. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me today. And I also want to say just a special thanks to the American Constitution Society and also to Abigail and Peggy for reaching out and organizing and arranging for everything. And I, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I, I love this topic. And please interrupt me at any time. I, uh, I, uh, I love talking about anything. I'm fascinated with arbitration. And so uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt you if, if you have any questions. And my plan for today is to share about just the current status of arbitration in American society. And I'd like to define what is arbitration, share how it's used, and also share about some of the harms I see from arbitration, some of the negative policy implications I see from this widespread use of arbitration. And if we have time, I'll briefly share and look at the past to discuss what brought us to this point. And I think there's some circumstances that began in the 80s that really turned towards and, and contributed to what we have today. And finally, looking forward, what's on the horizon for the continued use of arbitration? There are some positive developments, Abigail just mentioned, I think, in the fight against forced arbitration. And so that's my plan for today. And again, please interrupt me at any time. I'd love to answer questions. Um, so first, what is the meaning of the term arbitration? What is arbitration? And the main federal statute, which is the Federal Arbitration Act, which I'll refer to as the FAA, strangely, it does not contain any definition of arbitration. And that's causing some problems. Right now in the Supreme Court, one of the five cases will depend on what's the meaning of arbitration. So there are debates right now, just what is the very meaning or what are the core characteristics of arbitration? So this is subject to some controversy and debate, but here is a working definition that I tend to like. It's arbitration is based on a contract. It's, it's all contractually based. And this process allows for dispute to be resolved by a neutral decision maker, someone who's chosen by the parties, whose decision the parties have agreed to accept as bind, binding and final. And so this is just a working definition of arbitration. And just to focus on a few features here, arbitration is supposed to be based on the agreement of the parties. And I argue that really doesn't exist though in practice. And uh, this process is generally viewed as a private proceeding, but I question that. I, I think that maybe it should be, be viewed as a public proceeding in some ways and somebody's due process. If it's truly private, what's scary is that due process rights do not apply. And this process is intended to produce a final binding result. 
And I am just a huge fan of Star Wars. I don't know if you remember uh, episode six, this is Return of the Jedi. On Tatooine, there's this pit of Sarlacc. And this pit of Sarlacc actually makes a, uh, an appearance in the new Boba Fett series. But sometimes I compare arbitration to this pit of Sarlacc on Tatooine. Like once you're in that pit, once you're in that system of arbitration, it is very difficult to get out of it, just like the pit of Sarlacc. You'll be stuck in the system and it's difficult to escape. You really can't access the courts anymore for your underlying dispute. And so in the US, like 95% of the time, an arbitration agreement is fully enforceable and fully binding. And 99% of the time, an arbitrator's award is final and non-appealable. Now there are some subtle exceptions, some hyper-technical issues, and there are exceptions to exceptions in arbitration law, but chances are good. And you are most likely correct if you tell a client the agreement to arbitrate is most likely enforceable and any award that comes out of the arbitration process, it's generally unquestionable. Even if it's seriously an error, it cannot be appealed. And what scares me today, what deeply troubles me today is that virtually every type of dispute can be arbitrated today in the United States. And no other country uses arbitration as aggressively and expansively as we do. But as Abigail mentioned last month, President Biden did sign a new law into effect that amends arbitration that creates a very important exception to arbitration, but it's a very small exception. And so now I wanna focus on how widespread is the use of arbitration in American society and it's very widespread. There are 60 million employment arbitration agreements in place today. And I did a study in 2018, and just looking at the largest companies in America, 80% of America's largest employers use arbitration agreements in their workforce. And if you look at this from a different perspective, from a different angle, if you look at all the workers in America, in the 1990s, it used to be 1%, only 1% of American workers were covered by arbitration agreements, but this has exploded over time. Like uh, about 15 years ago, the numbers reached 25% of the American workforce are covered. And today the number is more than half, more than 55% of the American workforce is covered by arbitration agreements, which means they can't access the courts anymore for critical claims. And switching gears to the consumer setting, I found that in 2018, 81% of America's largest companies use arbitration for consumers. And I counted very conservatively more than 826 million consumer arbitration agreements in force in the US. And that's striking to me because we only have 330 million you know, men, women, and children in total in the US. And so arbitration really is widespread. And so today, when you are purchasing cell phone service or cable TV service or internet service, or today when you join a gym, you are likely bound to arbitrate. You are blocked from suing in court. Or if you buy or rent a home, the builder or the landlord may have included an arbitration clause in the document. So if you try to sue for a construction defect, you probably can't go to court. And I saw a recent fair housing case in New Orleans where the tenant is alleging serious discrimination and the court sends the case into arbitration because the tenant had signed a lease containing an arbitration clause. Whenever you establish a bank account or a credit card, agreement or the financial services industry in general is a heavy user of arbitration. Just looking at the financial services industry, there are statistics showing that 70% of financial services transactions today are covered by arbitration agreements. And so there are very widespread uses in the consumer setting and also for employment transactions involving arbitration clauses. And I'm nuts about basketball. I went to see the final four semifinal games this weekend and also the final last night here in New Orleans. And the parking lot where I parked my car had a sign with a little warning and the it said parking is subject to an arbitration clause. And uh, I know um, I'm a huge fan of burgers as well. And I think this, the official burger for the state of Texas is Whataburger. And um, I think you also have In-N-Out Burger in Dallas, which I think is far superior in my opinion. But a few years ago in the San Antonio region for their Whataburger stores, they had this sign posted on their doors where if you just step foot on the premises, you agree to arbitrate. And perhaps if there's a slip and fall, or if you get sick or injured in any way, if you have disagreement with one of their employees, it's now subject to arbitration. And I'm not sure if 
these arbitration notices still appear in the San Antonio area today. But if anyone's from that area, I'd love to confirm if these signs are still used. And McDonald's at the bottom of their French fry cartons had a reference to an arbitration clause that the Seventh Circuit in Chicago upheld. They've also appeared, arbitration clauses have appeared in the back of Cheerios boxes. Uh, they are just everywhere, everywhere. It's nuts in American society. I've had to order uh, a new dishwasher and washing machine recently this past year, and both came with a little piece of paper taped on the front of the machine saying that I'm bound to arbitrate. And I had got these, I think, through Lowe's, and Lowe's website already binds you to arbitrate anyway when you purchase anything through their websites. And so arbitration is so heavily used. I remember uh, when my first child was born, I was asked to sign an arbitration clause, and I was freaking out as a first-time parent. My wife was in labor, and I didn't want to sign away these rights to go to court if something went wrong with the delivery. I wanted the ability to take broad discovery in court of the nurses, the doctors, the hospital, uh, the insurance company if something went wrong. And but unfortunately, we were asked to sign and had to sign this arbitration clause. And I just, my wife was in labor and so I didn't want to sign the clause. I had her sign it just in case something went wrong. I could argue that she wasn't in her right state of mind at the moment. And thankfully everything went fine, but I, I see cases probably uh, once a month where a patient is seriously injured. Uh, and I've seen also um, deliveries where there are medical malpractice cases filed against um, OB OBGYNs where these cases are sent out of arbitration, sent out of court and sent into arbitration. Now, why, why, why do these agreements appear everywhere? And I think there are many reasons. Think about what's happening with an arbitration clause. You are blocked from going to court. You know, and a court has public proceedings. A, a court has broad procedural protections, like broad discovery rights to help prove your claims. And courts also have class action procedures so you can join together with other people who've been similarly harmed. But in arbitration, you don't really have broad procedural protections. For example, in arbitration, you don't have broad discovery. You tend to have very limited discovery. Also, arbitration is inherently one-on-one. -on -one. It's not a class or collective proceeding. And companies tend to like arbitration because it's one way to help avoid class action liability. And I've interviewed many lawyers for private plaintiffs and company lawyers as well. And this is more anecdotal, but many company lawyers have told me they use arbitration because they find that arbitration clauses completely discourage parties from ever bringing a claim. And I've interviewed some plaintiff's counsel who tell me that if there is an arbitration clause in the transaction, they're not likely to accept a client's representation if the client will be stuck in arbitration. And there's a, the most detailed empirical study I've ever seen has come from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They did a study in 2015, which is filled, it's like 300 or 400 pages, filled with incredible statistics about arbitration in case anyone's interested. But uh, there's, one, there's one particular finding that struck me. And this is a fact pattern I see every single day where a plaintiff files a lawsuit in court and then the defendant responds in court with a motion to dismiss and a motion to compel arbitration because there's an arbitration clause in connection with the transaction. So the defendant is asking the court in effect to enforce the arbitration agreement. And when a court does so, when a court orders arbitration, this is what stunned me. Uh, plaintiffs don't refile their claims in arbitration. Less than 25% of these situations actually proceed to arbitration, which means like 75% of the time when a court compels arbitration, the claim just goes away. And this suggests that arbitration is being used not really to resolve disputes, but to suppress claims. And wh what's going on? Why are sometimes people hesitant to go into arbitration? And I'll try to show you why and explain why. I've collected some harsh terms that you may see in arbitration clauses. And in extreme cases, you'll find several of these terms found in one agreement. And I think most of the time, though, in most average cases, you'll see maybe two or three of these harsh terms. But these harsh terms have the impact of making it more difficult for victims to prove their claims. I think that's probably one reason why attorneys are not willing to represent clients in arbitration. It's really an uphill battle. And so what are the, some of these harsh terms? Some arbitration clauses require arbitration in a distant location. And for example, if you have any dispute with Procter & Gamble, 
and they make a, a wide variety of household products. They've been sued for their Tide Pods because children have been swallowing them, but they have broad arbitration clauses with their transactions and you're required to arbitrate in Ohio. And you can imagine, say, if you're coming from Texas or California, that adds extra expense to find a lawyer who's willing to take on your case in Ohio. And so distant locations tend to be one harsh term found in the arbitration clauses. Also excessive fees. One unusual aspect of arbitration that doesn't really exist in litigation is that you have to pay the fees of the arbitrator. And these could be several hundred dollars per hour. And so excessive fees are a concern. Um, there are reported cases where consumers are stuck with three, $400,000 in fees at the end of the process that they've just lost. And that sometimes forces bankruptcy on behalf of the consumer. But you don't have to pay these particular fees if you go to court. Uh, you don't pay the judge's salary when you go to court. Another harsh term is confidentiality, which I'll talk more in detail about later, but um, arbitration proceedings tend to be confidential. Also, you'll see arbitration clauses with limits on remedies. And so the contract may say that the arbitrator cannot give punitive damages or treble damages, or sometimes the, it may be an explicit limit where the arbitrator is limited to giving you maybe $500 worth of damages. And so you see remedy limitations together with arbitration clauses. Also abbreviated statutes of limitations. Like if you bring a claim in court, I'm working on a case right now where the plaintiff in court would have four years to bring their claim but the arbitration clause says you only have 30 days. So you've got 30 days to hire a lawyer, figure out you've got a claim, file the claim in arbitration. Uh, but if you went to court, you would have four years. Like why are companies shortening the statute of limitations where you're blocked from going to court, right? But then if you wanna to go to arbitration, you only have 30, 45, or maybe 60 days to bring your claim. I think that's, there's no purpose there other than to suppress your claim. Another harsh term, You'll see sometimes where the company has stronger control over the selection of the arbitrator. I've seen this with a lot of restaurants where the restaurant will control the pool of arbitrators, and this is problematic. Uh, if the defendant, I don't think this is a justice system, you know, justice is supposed to be neutral. And if one side is selecting the arbitrator, that's very problematic. Also, there are severe bans on discovery or severe limits on discovery, which makes it more difficult to prove a claim and no class or collective, collective actions, where if you went to court, you'd have the right to broad joinder or broad procedural protection, such as a, a class action or collective action rights, but that doesn't really exist with arbitration. So what is the impact of all these harsh terms? You know, um, this is just a visual, like uh, if you imagine a soccer game with this tilted field, like theoretically you could still win, if you have a player like Messi or Ronaldo, but the game is much harder to win if you've got this tilted playing field. And so you'll see, this is just a quote from a, a, just a court decision involving a consumer arbitration where the judge was very frank and said, look, all these harsh terms, they're really not designed for resolving disputes. They're really designed to tilt the process in the favor of the corporate party. This is really about claim suppression. And if you see a court, sorry, if a court sees an arbitration clause with multiple harsh terms, in the past, the court could possibly invalidate the entire agreement. Like if you see a clause with maybe five or six harsh terms, a court in the past was likely to invalidate the agreement. Or sometimes court would just strike out the harsh terms and still compel arbitration, which is problematic. But do you see the problem if a court just strikes out the harsh terms and redlines them out? I think that just incentivizes harsh drafting and some people may be discouraged from even filing a claim if they see all these harsh terms together in their arbitration clause. And so you will see or prior to 2010, you'll see a lot more court decisions that will somewhat police or monitor arbitration agreements for some degree of fairness to make sure that they're not too, too many harsh terms, but you would see courts would differ. You would find courts reaching conflicting decisions as to the enforceability of an arbitration clause. Like there's a, a famous case involving Countrywide, horrible allegations of sexual harassment against Countrywide, the, the home mortgage company. I think they're now owned by Bank of America. But the exact same fact pattern in Texas and the exact same fact pattern was also before a court in California. The California court was willing to invalidate the arbitration clause, but the Texas court was willing to enforce the exact same clause 
under the exact same set of facts. And so you will see in the past at some minimal role of courts supervising the fairness of arbitration proceedings, you'll still see conflicting decisions, but I think that's now all in the past. Um, courts today are less likely to review an arbitration clause for fairness. And this is, I have no words to describe this, what, what, what uh, parties are doing now. Take a look at this. This is just a sample clause, some very simple, straightforward language where you and I, like you, you, the company, and I, we agree to arbitrate all the speeds that arise between us. This may appear in a consumer contract or an employment contract. And this is normal. This has existed for, for decades. But what's not normal is what you'll see is the following term. And this gets me every time. There's a further statement that you and I also agree to arbitrate, whether we agree to arbitrate. And so if you have any concerns about the arbitration clause, guess what? You're going to arbitrate those concerns about the enforceability of the arbitration agreement. And so think about who's now supervising the process. It used to be the courts, but in a case involving rent -a center the Supreme Court gave its blessing for these. These are called delegation clauses, where the power to review the arbitration clause itself is delegated to the arbitrator. So you're not just, this is crazy, you're not just agreeing to arbitrate, you're agreeing to arbitrate whether you agree to arbitrate. I think most people are completely unaware of an arbitration clause or its impact. It's comical, it's absurd to say that you also have agreed to arbitrate whether you agree to arbitrate. That doesn't really exist. I think that's just a, a fake premise. It's just a, a false assumption by the courts. But these terms now are routinely rubber stamped by judges. And so we don't get those judicial decisions as much anymore where courts would review arbitration agreements for fairness. They're now, these fairness decisions are now going to the arbitrator. And think about this. The arbitrator has a financial interest in continuing the arbitration. And it's the arbitrator who will decide whether the arbitration clause is fair or not. And I tried to raise this issue before the Florida Supreme Court. It's a case involving Airbnb. There's a couple that was secretly recorded in the bedroom in an Airbnb rental, and they're suing Airbnb for a host of claims. And right, this is just a decision issued last Thursday by the Florida Supreme Court. I heavily attacked this practice of delegating to an arbitrator who has a, a strong financial interest in finding arbitration. And the Florida Supreme Court disagreed and said, no, this all goes to the arbitrator. And I have a lot of problems with that. But that was a recent Airbnb decision from the Florida Supreme Court last week. And so an arbitrator today will decide whether the arbitration clause is enforceable. And that's really absurd to me. Uh, that same Consumer Financial Protection Bureau study that I mentioned found that more than 90% of consumers are not aware of arbitration clauses in their contracts. And so there really is no meaningful consent. And so it's just a fiction to say that we've agreed to arbitrate whether we agreed to arbitrate. And the entire power of the arbitrator is supposed to be derived from this consent. Like you can give up a right, like the right to a jury trial, but with knowing voluntary, meaningful consent. And unfortunately, I think meaningful consent is mainly lacking in the arbitration context. And think about the policy implications of this. Like compare confidential arbitration to public court proceedings. We lose the value of public dispute resolution if we send all of our claims to arbitration. Like if proceedings are public, think about the impact of this if we have open court proceedings. Society and our legislatures can learn about wrongdoing and take further action. Or um, you know, if you think about the public nature of court proceedings, the very public nature of these proceedings can help pub just punish wrongdoers almost with a punitive effect. And the public nature of court proceedings may also discourage or deter future wrongdoing, but we lose all of that with the confidential nature of arbitration. Also, the confidential nature of arbitration may make it more difficult to gather evidence and prove claims. And this is a scary example. Um, I take this from, uh, so there's several news stories about this. I took this headline from the Washington Post. Jared and Kay Jewelers, they're all across America, and they had a serious widespread problem company-wide with sexual harassment. And lawyers for the victims are reported as saying that it was almost impossible to collect evidence in these cases and testimony from other coworkers. And it was impossible to learn the full extent of how widespread the harassment was at the company. 
because everyone was bound by confidentiality through their arbitration clauses. And some people think that the Me Too movement could have arrived much earlier if it were not for arbitration clauses. I was helping with an arbitration, trying to get out of arbitration against a prominent employer on behalf of a worker here in New Orleans. And unfortunately, we were compelled to arbitrate. And the arbitrator issued an order saying that the worker cannot speak to anyone in connection with the case, even to collect evidence, which makes it almost impossible, much more difficult, much more difficult to help prove a case. And another example from the harm of confidentiality, Amazon. Amazon is accused of selling dangerous counterfeit items like fake baby car seats or controlled substances. And Amazon is also accused of deceptive business practices. But class action claims filed in court against Amazon were all dismissed because of arbitration agreements imposed by Amazon on its customers. Now, as a side note, just last summer, with public pressure, Amazon decided to drop arbitration clauses for its consumers, but arbitration, but Amazon still aggressively uses arbitration clauses for its workforce. The nursing home industry heavily uses arbitration. And because of the confidential nature of arbitration, it's harder to discover problematic abuse at a nursing home. And I'm sharing all these examples to help illustrate some harms from forced arbitration. There are certain claims in my personal view that should not be covered by arbitration, like any claims for personal injury or civil rights claims. You know, anytime there's a strong public interest in learning about the wrongdoing. Now, for a business to business dispute, like over the shipment of goods that allegedly arrives like one or two days late, I'm fine sending that contract dispute to an arbitrator if the businesses want to. But I have problems with the widespread use of arbitration in the consumer and employment settings. So there are harms from this private nature of arbitration. And uh, also there are harms from the limited procedural protections available. It's just harder for plaintiffs, for victims to win. And there are studies that confirm this. In the employment setting, there's a wonderful study comparing employment arbitration to employment litigation in court. In arbitration, there are lower awards and lower win rates. Like in arbitration for employees, the win rate is about 20%. But if you go to federal court, that jumps to 33%. And if you go to state court, it jumps to 50 or 60%. And so there's some wonderful statistics in the employment setting showing the harms, the practical impact of forced arbitration. And another harm, arbitration interferes with the, just the development of law. And this is a wonderful quote from Justice Kennedy before he retired. He mentioned, he made this observation in a speech that the docket of the Supreme Court seems to be changing. A lot of big civil cases are going to arbitration. This is something he said before he retired. I don't see as many of the big civil cases anymore. If you think about our, our entire common law system, it's built on precedent. But arbitration destroys this common law system. We have fewer court decisions today in certain areas of law because disputes are being sent and heard in private arbitration. And you can argue that arbitration hinders the development of law. We lose the benefit of seeing written court decisions on how to apply the law in different settings. Like, I don't know how we would go through law school studying law if we couldn't look at cases anymore. And so that's, there's several concerns there. Another policy concern with arbitration, there's a lack of diversity with arbitrators. There are very few women and very few minorities serving as arbitrators. And when you have diversity in the decision makers, I think that the different rich life experiences of the judge or the arbitrator improves the administration of justice. And, I think that diversity builds up trust and public confidence in the system. And as a side note, that's one reason I hope Judge Brown Jackson uh, should be confirmed very quickly. And I've read thousands and thousands of arbitration court decisions over the years, and I've never seen such wonderful decisions as I saw coming from Judge Brown Jackson. They were the most detailed, most thoughtful decisions from any judge I've ever seen in this field. She wrestled with the law so deeply so much better and more thoughtful than Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, or Barrett with their lower court opinions. So I fully trust her judgment that she'll give a fair, thorough hearing for any case she's presented with. I hope she gets confirmed soon. But um, you see a lack, a problem with the lack of diversity. This exists on the bench, of course, but it also, it's, it's I think, even more heightened in arbitration. And there's a high profile case involving Jay-Z, the rap star. Um, he, he, com he was involved in an arbitration and he complained that the arbitrators he was seeing that they were presented to him, none of them were diverse. And after complaining, he was given a list of 200 arbitrators that were qualified to hear the case. 
These were all from the AAA, the American Arbitration Association. And only three out of the 200 were African-American and one was connected to the defendant. And so uh, they were conflicted out from serving on the case. And so there's a, a serious problem with the lack of diversity in arbitration. The major providers are beginning to listen and try to improve their diversity, which I think is critical for helping to improve the system, but there's currently is a problem with the lack of diversity in arbitration. So if you think about this, all the different possible harms, you know, at its most basic, just the most basic harm though, is that we've lost access to our courts on a large scale. We have an entire shadow system of private for-profit justice and courts used to have a role supervising the system for just basic minimal fairness, but even that's disappearing. What's scary to me is I have no idea who's watching this private system anymore. And arbitrators are largely unregulated. In the vast majority of states, you don't even have to be an attorney to serve as an arbitrator. And I'm very torn and divided. I have just the strongest love-hate relationship with arbitration. I don't know if you remember the old cartoon characters, Tom and Jerry, at one moment, they're best of friends and the other moment, they're just the worst of enemies. And I feel the same way with arbitration. There are some horrific abuses of arbitration, particularly in the consumer setting and the employment setting that I despise. But there are, arbitration by itself though, if you look at it neutrally, there are some positive uses of arbitration, uh, particularly for business to business, pure commercial disputes where there's no deep public interest. And you know, arbitration is older than our country, it goes back to ancient times. And uh, you may have heard of arbitration in the sports league setting. Uh, for the Olympics, for example, you may be able to get a quick expert decision maker who will help enforce you know, the, the rules of that particular sports league or the industry norms. You know, I don't know if I want a jury of lay persons in a traditional court to hear a claim about ice skating rules. That would take forever to go to a court and the Olympics, Olympics would already be over. But when the Olympics occur, there are arbitration panels on standby for any sports related disputes that may arise. And you may have seen this in the most recent Winter Olympics with the Russian figure skater. Also in the religious setting, there's a very long tradition in Islam, Christianity and Judaism to use arbitration even for commercial disputes among members of these faiths. And the idea is if there's, assuming there's mutual consent and meaningful willingness to do this and a neutral decision maker, arbitration can be used powerfully to help implement shared values in a small community. And there, so there are some good settings for arbitration and in the union setting, which is very different from the individual employment setting, arbitration I think has a better name and a better track record. But with a union, a union has stronger bargaining power than an individual employee. You know, and there are mutual long-term interests with an employer and a union to help ensure a fair arbitration system. You know, individual workers may come and go, but with a union, they tend to have a longer existence. And with that long-term relationship between a union and an employer, they'll have stronger mutual interest in developing a fair system. And so in the labor setting with a union, arbitration is often well-regarded, but that's very different from the individual employee setting. And one more positive example, um, this happened about 15 years ago in Bangladesh. There was a massive unfortunate collapse of a factory in the apparel industry. And it, it injured on countless people and killed more than a thousand workers. And several workers' rights groups working together with the apparel companies, like major corporations across the globe, they developed fair protocols for safety standards in these factories. In other words, they created substantive law that would help promote just worker protections and worker safety. But there was a concern that the local courts of Bangladesh would not enforce this substantive law aggressively. And so what's interesting is that working together with workers' rights groups and these apparel companies, they jointly created an arbitration system to help fill in this gap because they believe that local courts would not enforce these rights aggressively. So these are some positive examples of arbitration. And, uh, but I see a lot of abuse on the worker side and the consumer side here in American society. So how did we get here? Um, it, all of this changed in the 1920s. In the 1920s, you see the rise of arbitration laws. And so in 1925, Congress passed this law, it's a federal statute, and it's the governing, it's the main statute governing arbitration today. And, it, and it's heart and soul of this language right here. 
arbitration agreements are fully binding. They're fully binding. And New York passed a similar statute in 1920. And so something happened critically during the 1920s. And before the 1920s, these agreements were not enforceable in American society. After the 1920s, uh, you saw that all of a sudden, almost overnight, the federal government in several states began passing arbitration laws, making agreements binding. Why was there such a switch during the 1920s? Just to quickly go over a few reasons why the laws changed, and it will shed some, it'll just help shed some light as just to the meaning of arbitration or why we have our arbitration laws. At one time in American history, our society and our economy was described as having you know, small, little, separate island communities. We mainly had rural, agrarian, frag a fragmented society. But after the Civil War until 1920, you see a great period of change in American society where there's a, a more, um, more, the society became more interconnected. You see advances in transportation. You see advances in industrialization, immigration, urbanization. In the 1920 census, for the first time, more Americans were living in cities as opposed to rural areas, and that caused problems on its own. But you see at this time period, just a rapid change on every front in American society. There was a transition from this fragmented economy to a more interconnected national economy. And so we had a lot of uh, a large period of change during this time. And among business people, there was a sense that life was spinning out of control and a value started to develop, a more progressive or bureaucratic value that there's a strong belief at this time that to, to deal with all of these changes, let's turn over decisions to experts. And so at this time in American history, you'll see the, the creation of the Food and Drug Administration. You know, this is an example of handing power over to specialist experts. You see more juvenile courts being created. And again, this is a specialized tribunal. And you see the very beginnings of the rise of the administrative state at this time. And arbitration, which allows you to select an expert decision maker, deeply resonated with the reformers during this time period. Also, if you recall your Civ Pro class, our civil procedure rules did not come into play until 1938. Before that time, the federal court procedure was just a mess where individual federal judges would borrow whatever procedures they wanted from the local state court system. And I've tracked down diaries from, uh, from attorneys where attorneys will say practicing in federal court was like Sanskrit or Byzantine, it was like a foreign language. And so there was a great push at the time for a simplified procedures. And if you think about arbitration, it's a simplified procedure. It was very attractive compared to the complexity of courts at the time. And this, bogg this boggles my mind, but uh, courts were overwhelmed through the 1920s. I don't know if you recognize the person on the screen. Who's that person? It's uh, Al Capone. And it's hard for me to comprehend this, but at one time in American history, um, it was viewed as a rational decision to completely broadly ban alcohol. And so we had prohibition during the 1920s. And this is a shocking statistic, but in the federal courts, they were so overwhelmed with prohibition cases, two thirds of the entire federal docket was overwhelmed with all prohibition cases. And so in some large cities, you had a multiple year delay to hear cases. And so the business interest of the company wanting to get their business cases heard, that's what pushed them towards arbitration. That's why you see the change in the 1920s to a modern arbitration law, making agreements to arbitrate fully enforceable. And just one more quick example of the First World War had a huge impact on the development of arbitration laws. There are multiple reasons why, but one idea was that economic rivalries led to the First World War. And there was a thinking that arbitration would help avoid economic rivalries. And so the original arbitration statute did cover international disputes. And you'll see the League of Nations, which was a precursor to the United Nations, they also used arbitration to settle international disputes. And so at the time period, I just uh, there was maybe this is an over idealistic view, but there was a hope that arbitration would help avoid future wars, and so that's why arbitration deeply resonated in the 1920s. And so those are a few reasons why arbitration laws change. Sorry, that's my dog going crazy in the background. Um, and so in the 1920s, just to, just to wrap up, um, arbitration law was at first adopted just for business to business disputes. It was never intended at all for employment disputes, but you begin to see this change 
in the 1980s through the 2000s, where in 2001, the Supreme Court applied arbitration to employment disputes. And then um, the Arbitration Act was never intended to apply in state courts, but you see in 1984, the Supreme Court held that it applies in state courts. And the FAA was only intended for contractual disputes. It was never intended for statutory claims or personal injury claims. But you see this change in the 1980s as well in a famous case called Mitsubishi. What is going on? Why did the court just transform arbitration law? And um, there are a lot of reasons why, but uh, there's one interesting theory that beginning in the 1980s, you see a conservative movement to undercut the enforcement of substantive rights. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, you see the passage of wonderful landmark civil rights statutes and consumer protection statutes, some of the best statutes in human history protecting vulnerable parties. And there's a theory, it's a wonderful theory, I heavily recommend this book. It's a book called Rights Retrenchment. And the idea is that it was not politically feasible to directly attack these substantive rights, like civil rights. But using an indirect manner, by impacting procedures, people can undermine the enforcement of substantive rights. And the authors quote wonderful evidence. The most striking for me included some memos from a young lawyer in the Justice Department who made procedural proposals to make it more difficult to bring substantive federal claims. And that young lawyer was John Roberts, who's now the Chief Justice. And the book discusses several procedural attacks on substantive rights. And arbitration fits perfectly with this theory during the 1980s, why arbitration laws changed. Was, they were ex interpreted more expansively, I think, to help undercut substantive rights. And for me, this is a larger concept, but our substantive rights, we can have the greatest rights in the world, but they're meaningless if you're not able to enforce them. Robust enforcement can occur, though, through the courts. Now, um, we've swung to such a degree where arbitration agreements are fully, fully enforceable. They're widespread in American society. I'm very glad to say that there was strong bipartisan support, and I wasn't expecting this. This is what Abigail began with today, mentioning that last month, President Biden signed one narrow amendment banning arbitration of sexual assault and sexual harassment claims. And I think it's a great step. I love the goals of this act, but I think it's too narrow. You know, it doesn't cover gender discrimination. It doesn't cover race discrimination. And uh, last, this was last month, uh, the House passed a broader bill to ban all consumer and all employment arbitration. I think it was just sent to the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. I think it will likely die out in the Senate. And so we have this small, small little reform. And my hope is that we'll see greater reforms in the next few years. That will depend on who's in the White House, who's in Congress. But my hope is that there'll be continued reforms. I think we're getting close to, uh, the end of time, I, I'd love to take any questions. That's pretty much, I can go on forever, but uh, please ask me any questions. I, I love this topic. Thank you so much, Professor Sala. It is so interesting. I know I personally did not know anything about the uh, Federal Arbitration Act. So it's been a very interesting um, lecture. So um, I will start off with a question and then anyone else with questions, feel free um, to raise your hand. I was um, curious about, what do you think that as law students, as up and coming lawyers that we can do to um, get people talking about this forced arbitration system? It seems like a shadow justice system that has kind of grown into this massive thing that no one really wants to talk about. Sure, sure. Uh, one thing I've seen, um, I've seen some law students speak out against law firms requiring the use of arbitration. And uh, this has been successful. Um, people are beginning to identify which firms, which companies are using arbitration. I think just awareness, just talking about it. Um, I think that's what's bringing on these changes in Congress. This has flown under the radar for so much. Um, I think it's critical just to be aware, to talk with your friends, talk with your family members. Do you know that most of our rights are actually gone, that the courts are just a facade, that we can't really access the courts because of these tiny little clauses in our contracts. And so I think just pointing it out to people um, uh, like I just talked to my son yesterday at the final four game, like, look at what it's saying in the parking lot. And actually when we were coming back from the game, I saw several people being booted 
And I saw the workers just double check, you know, is this, is this the appropriate call? I can imagine some fights arising from booting cars and it will go to arbitration. And that's a small, small, silly example perhaps, but uh, I was able to use that moment just to share with my son, you know what, you can't go to court if there was a problem if they boot the wrong car. And so I think simply discussing arbitration, uh, I find that some civil procedure textbooks don't even mention arbitration. And, um, and I think it's important to realize the impact that we, our entire civil procedure system, it's almost off limits. I question why we're even studying it sometimes in class because arbitration has such a deep impact. And so I think simply discussing arbitration, if we're willing to take an extra step, um, you know, speaking to Congress members, uh, using social media, social media caused, um, I forget who makes Jolly Green Giant. I forget who makes that, um, that vegetable can, uh, the vegetables, or they're, they're, they make a lot of different food products. I don't know, does but, that, anyone in the audience know? I can't remember who makes I the Jolly Green Giant. It's a large consumer company, but they backed down from arbitration because of just a lot of negative social media attention. The same thing with Google. Google and Amazon, I think, recently backed down voluntarily. Uh, they narrowly limited arbitration just because more people are talking about it. And so, so I encourage you to think about these clauses. Be, on, be aware uh, of these clauses. And if you see any crazy examples, please reach out and send me an email. I, I love collecting examples, extreme examples of arbitration that I've seen over time. So just be aware and, and, and talk about it. I think that's a positive first step. Yes, I know we talked briefly when we were setting this up that you haven't taught a forced arbitration class in a while, and I know there's not one um, at SMU Law, so maybe we start there. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyone else, any questions? Okay, I'll keep asking you some questions then. Um, what do you expect the Supreme Court to do um, in this term with the Forced Arbitration Act? Yes, yeah, so um, the, the Supreme Court is hearing five different cases, and the past track record of the last 40 years has been arbitration always wins. And so um, unfortunately, you'll see heavily divided like five, four, five or six, three decisions where the more conservative justices tend to enforce arbitration and uh, the more liberal justices tend to be more protective of just victims. And so um, I, I don't expect much. I don't expect much from the Supreme Court in terms of uh, changing arbitration. I think they're, they've been on a very long track record of just expanding it beyond the, just the way that the, ta the statute uh, reads. And I think what's going on, just, the Supreme Court traditionally takes one or two cases a year involving arbitration, and that's a lot. You know, uh, they get 10,000 requests. They accept about 70 or 80 cases, and they typically reserve maybe one or two spots a year just to help fine tune the system. And this term, they accepted five cases and it's tough to know exactly why, but it's an unprecedented amount. And I think the justices are perhaps aware of just the larger debates in society and in Congress about the use of arbitration. And so what I'm suspecting is that some of the justices may want to preserve the broad use of arbitration. And so perhaps they took on these several cases to help clarify and fine tune some aspects of arbitration law that were dividing lower courts, just to show that you know, this arbitration system is well, it's, it's uh, functioning smoothly. We're correcting arbitration. So it's a great, uh, it's a great use. It's just a well-functioning system. And perhaps that lar the larger discussions in society are causing the court to take a closer look. But I, I don't expect any, um, anything but a pro-arbitration decisions to come out from the court. That's very interesting. I think, okay, I think we have one question from the audience. Do you want to come up? You can. Okay, she's going to come up. And speak well, sure. in the microphone. Hi, um, apologies if this has already been answered. I, I had to come in a little bit late, but I guess I'm just wondering, I don't know a lot about um, preemption and I'm wondering, are there any like constitutional issues that would pull um, or that would, I guess, like render um, a, an arbitration agreement like ineffective or like, ineffective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so because it's a federal statute, since the 1980s, the court has held that it preempts conflicting state laws. Now, um, I think that's incorrect. Arbitration is procedural law. The original statute was just designed to govern federal court proceedings, and state courts were free to do whatever they wanted with arbitration. 
But since the 1980s, the Supreme Court has read the arbitration clauses having a very broad preemptive impact. And so you, you'll see a lot of state laws displaced by arbitration. Um, for example, California about a year or two ago made it a crime for employers to require the signing of arbitration clauses. This is a strange statute. No other state is like California with this respect, but they criminalized arbit the forced arbitration in the employment setting. And that law is likely to be preempted by the federal statute. Um, the law doesn't invalidate an arbitration agreement. If you happen to sign one, it's still binding, but the employer could be uh, fined with a misdemeanor for forcing you to sign one. But uh, you'll see that states try to limit arbitration, but traditionally they've been preempted. Um, there, is, there, are a few, there are a few constitutional questions. Um, it must involve interstate commerce in order to trigger the Federal Arbitration Act. And so from time to time, you'll see a very, very local dispute. It tends to involve like local real estate where there's an arbitration clause and a court may be willing to say, we can't enforce it because it does not trigger interstate commerce. And you really need interstate commerce to trigger the Federal Arbitration Act. And there's one actually very hidden issue involving this, uh, the recent amendments involving sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, there's an argument that sexual assault and sexual harassment do not involve interstate commerce. And so there's an argument that this amendment, even though it's wonderful and I fully support this amendment, I think the goals are amazing, but uh, there was a 2000 decision, it was called, uh, I think Morrissey or, or um, Morrissey versus US, where the Supreme Court held that sexual assault is not economic activity and it's beyond the scope of the, the Commerce Clause powers. And so I think that the, this recent amendment is a wonderful amendment but I think that there could be some people challenging the amendment as being unconstitutional. So there definitely are constitutional questions. And one of them is lurking behind the scenes with this most recent amendment. Just does it really involve interstate commerce if you have a sexual harassment claim or sexual assault claim? It's so interesting that you bring up the Commerce Clause because I feel like the most recent Commerce Clause um, opinions to come out of the Supreme Court have been conservatives trying to walk back the Commerce Clause. So it's interesting that it has opposite implications um, for conservative justices in terms of forced arbitration. Yes. Yeah. So I had um, one more question. I was just really curious about what are some of the legal arguments you can make when you are representing a, a plaintiff that has signed, I guess not necessarily a plaintiff, but um, an individual that signed a arbitration agreement. Um, have you seen anything be more successful um, than certain arguments? I guess? Yeah, the number one argument to invalidate an arbitration clause is unconscionability. So if you can show that there are five or six harsh terms in the arbitration clause, a sympathetic judge may be willing to invalidate the agreement. But for every one of these cases that you see where the employee or the, or the victim consumer gets out of arbitration, you can find the exact same clause being enforced by another, by another court. But the best argument to make is unconscionability, that the terms are harsher or one-sided. The other argument is where there may be good language. The language of the arbitration clause may be fine and fair, you know, with no harsh terms, but the way it was implemented did not really give you fair notice. And so there's an example of an app where you downloaded the app through your iPhone but you would not see the arbitration clause unless you pressed, I think at the bottom of the screen, there's a short description of the app and you had to press more terms and scroll through like five or 10 screens to get to the arbitration clause. And a court invalidated the arbitration clause there because you, it really wasn't visible. And sometimes the arbitration clause will be covered up by like the, the pop-up keypad on your cell phone. And so if you can argue, and the standard was actually developed by Justice Sotomayor in the second circuit when she was an appellate judge, and it's spread across the country, is whether there's conspicuous notice of the arbitration clause. And I think that's why I saw the parking sign last night. It said this, these parking terms are governed and subject to arbitration. That made it more conspicuous. And so there really are two arguments to get out of an arbitration clause. It is uh, unconscionability that they're harsh terms, or there was some problem with its implementation so that it was not conspicuous.
Thank you so much, Professor. And one question off of that, just out of curiosity, when you do represent these individuals, are you doing this as uh, pro bono work? Is there any yes. way? Um, okay. There's like no, because there's no attorney's fees or anything. No, no. This. Yeah, I'm just helping out. It's just a great practice with my students where usually I'll take my Civ Pro students and I'll ask them to help me with a brief to try to protect the worker or the consumer to argue why this clause is not enforceable. And so uh, those are the cases that I tend to help out with just to try to get the, um, to try and invalidate the arbitration clause. That's amazing. Well, um, all of you, please join me in um, thanking Professor Emery Sazali for um, coming to speak with us today. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Please don't hesitate to reach Hi, out. Jay. Oh, oh thanks, yes. thanks. Like if you have any questions, I'll put my, my email up on the screen. If you have any, any examples, any questions down the road, if you ever face an arbitration clause, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. I, I really love this topic and thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Of course, thank you so much. And also visit his blog, www.arbitrationusa, um, right? Or Arbitration yes, yes. Law, USA. Yeah, arbitration USA. yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you so much, guys.